the structure of this is that each speaker, each of the two speakers is going to have about 15 minutes to give their talk. And I shouldn't have said about 15 minutes. I'm going to be incredibly strict, Anna and Moses, and say you only have 15 minutes to speak. And then I'm delighted that we've got two people who are going to come some kind of responses from some, from some quite different places to what's been said. And then we should have about half an hour, 40 minutes to open up to have um, questions and explore some of the themes. And, and my suggestion is that we will use a mix of people raising their hands, and you can use that by using the reactions button at the bottom of the screen or posting in the chat. Um, but I'll explain that more when we get there. So I'm gonna come to our speakers now, and I, I'm kind of humbled and delighted at the speakers we've, we've, we've got today. So the first speaker um, is Anna uh, Nabulia, who's a Deputy Executive Director of UDEL, at the Uganda Youth Development uh, Link. And I'm sure many of you here already know Anna, those of you at the Gulu conference would have heard her great kind of input there. Um, Anna's got an incredible track record and history of working in this, in, in this kind of space. She currently oversees all the programs of partners um, relating to trafficking in persons and safe, safe migration, sex, sexual exploitation, exploitation and abuse of children. She's been engaged at a global scale um, with the Hilton Worldwide Global Freedom Exchange program on child sex trafficking. US State Department fellow under the Community Solutions Program. Incredibly uh, rich experience in this space. And, and it really, uh, I can't express our, our appreciation enough to Anna for, for taking the time out. I know how busy she is and, and she's involved in so many really important things in coming and talking to us. The second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Moses Okech. And again, I'm sure some of you already know uh, Moses. Uh, Moses is uh, one of the key figures um, along with um, uh, Robert and the other team, but Robert in particular, Robert Moses within the um, Uganda, uh, the Refugee Youth Volunteer in Uganda project, in really driving what we're doing, really building connections with young people. Moses has an incredible track record as a development, is both a development practitioner and kind of professional, but also as an academic, you know, so doing three work with the International Rescue Committee, but the World Bank, the, the UK's Overseas Development Institute, GIZ, many others. He has a, he has a PhD um, from Leeds Beckett University in the UK and for me, and this is more a personal thing than a formal introduction, has been a kind of amazing font of knowledge for me as I've been learning more and more about the kind of experiences of young refugees in Uganda. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to Anna for her uh, 15 minutes and then we'll go straight on to Moses and then we'll have the respondents and the questions. So Anna, over to you. Thank you, Matt. I'll put on my camera for just one minute for the people to see who, whose voice is behind the uh, behind here, and I'll share my screen. Um, allow me to share my screen. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and now turn off my camera and then kick start us into the discussion. My name is Anna Navulia. I work with Uganda Youth Development Link as the deputy director. And like Matt has done a very good uh, introduction of myself, so I'll not repeat most of what he has said, but I'm going to try and share with you quite a number of experiences of what I have seen in my line of work for the last 17 years as a social worker and a practitioner working with volunteers, sometimes managing volunteers and supervising them. But I also try to bring in some of the experiences of my own uh, individual volunteering programs that I've been part of. So uh, just give, briefly to give you a background of what uh, Uganda Youth Development Link is. It's a non-government organization that was started in, 20, in uh, 27 years ago and uh, has been working in Uganda for, uh, for quite some time now in mainly Kampala, Mokono, Waki. So mainly in the central region of Kampala, though we do quite a lot of work in advocacy in other regions of, of, of uh, Uganda as well. And we do quite a lot of work around socioeconomic rehabilitation of young people who have been affected by alcohol, drug and substance abuse, commercial sexual exploitation, child trafficking, labor, and uh, sexual reproductive health and HIV. But we also engage quite a lot in research as well. So um, we were given three questions to guide our discussions today. And one of them was uh, for us to look at the relationship between volunteering, skills development, and employability. And uh, just for me, I thought that uh, I'll bring in some of these key issues that have to do with uh, the relationship between volunteering, skills development, and em employability, and how they are interrelated or interconnected. And I feel that once an organization has a culture of volunteering, of course, uh, this can help the employees boost their morale. There's a lot of uh, 
of, of, of morale boosting within the workspace as atmosphere, but also brand perception, because then that means that this organization is able to give back to communities, but also is taking care of its employees and not piling them with so much work. And yet there are hands there that are willing to uh, support them with the work that is available. But we also think that uh, there's a relationship between volunteering and attracting the best talent that is out there. Sometimes it's very difficult for us to know who has what particular skills. Sometimes we get into interviews and meetings. I've been into very many interviews and assessed very many uh, people who are applying for jobs, but it's very difficult for you to attract a good talent. But when people volunteer with you in your organization, it's very easy for you to know who has what particular talent and who is good at what. And it's it makes work easier for the employers or for the other employees to also know that they can count on a volunteer out there. But also volunteership is very good in helping us um, expanding our networks, especially business networks, um, expanding our friends, spaces, social networks. So it means that, of course, when you have a large social network or when you have a wide network, it will increase your uh, your chances of being employed or employability chances of getting contracts or getting consultancies out there. But again, it means that you'll have a wide range of networks of people to rely on to help you develop your particular skill or those skills that you're not able to do by yourself to rely on somebody else to get that done for you. And that makes it uh, really a good relationship between volunteering and employability and also skills development. And then we're looking at also, it, it's a precursor for, volunteering is a precursor for job entry for many NGOs especially. Uh, one of the things that they'll ask you in interviews is, have you volunteered somewhere? Have you done some kind of volunteership work? What kind of work is that? They are basically looking at a job fit person who, uh, you know, who has had some kind of exposure, but they are also looking at, uh, you know, trying to train you into the culture of the organization, because when you come in as a volunteer, it's easier for you to adapt to the culture of the organization. And once you're in there, it's very easy for them to take you on and promote you into employment as well. And also we've seen this very much with uh, mainly uh, young people just coming out of formal education and non-formal education who have been doing quite a lot of theoretical work and very, very little experience on practice. So usually what NGOs want, like for example, my NGO, they would prefer that uh, somebody comes in and volunteers and that person has a higher chance of them getting into job entry. But of course, there's quite a lot of things to do with decision-making on employability for those that have volunteered. Those that have volunteered, you know, get higher chances of uh, being employed than those that are not that have not done any voluntary work because then it shows you, know, you don't have the self-drive. It shows you do not have the self, um, reliance or it's very difficult for you uh, to assess the soft skills of somebody if they do not engage in volunteership. But then we also look at issues of job specific skills, which can be gotten if you do volunteer, but also uh, the fact that you can be easily be absorbed into uh, job different job opportunities and it can also better your job performance. And of course, we look at self-development. Many people have come in as volunteers, but have uh, through the volunteership packages, they are able to specialize in a, in a specific skill. We've had volunteers who have come in and they just want to, you know, enhance their skills in, 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 in football. We've had those that have come in and are very good with social media fundraising and they, they want to take that line of work. There are those that come in and are very good with gender issues. There are those that are very good with advocacy and documentation. So it also helps you with, uh, in terms of skills development, it helps you with... Uh, specialization, but also increases your ability to serve uh, different clients within the community. And of course, there's a lot of uh, greater di uh, staff diversity when an organization has a volunteership program. Now, the other question was to do with whether uh, volunteering contributes to mutual learning, skills development, and employability. And I say yes, to a great extent, this does uh, contribute. And of course, it adds up to more experience onto your resume. For example, if you're a student or somebody who is trying to look for a job out there, or if you're a young person who is just coming out of a vocational training institute and would like to uh, find a job or get entry into employability, you will have higher chances on your resume. You will have an addition to put onto your resume. 
but also it will expand your networks, of course, and you know the, the beauty, the value of having uh, networks. I already explained that. I will not go back into why it's important for you to have good social networks and also uh, and the connectivity or the beauties that come with that. But it also helps you to avoid those job gaps, especially when you're moving into different job opportunities or if you're leaving one company and uh, you do not have uh, you know, a job and you're trying to look for another opportunity. So you use that time to volunteer and that helps fill up that gap in your resume so that when you go into another job or when you apply for another job, it's easier for you to explain what you were doing within that time when you were not working. And of course you can learn and apply new skills. Uh, there are several people that come in and have different skills, our staff learn from them, but also the volunteers also learn from our staff. So they go back with quite a wide range of uh, services and quite a wide range of knowledge and abilities to do different things. But I'm also looking at the issue of coping, especially for volunteers that come into the low development countries or that work in situations that are very critical. For example, for us, we get volunteers who come in and want to work with children who have been trafficked or those that have been sexually exploited within the rural and urban settings. The fact that they're adapting within those areas and they're able to learn and live with those communities and work with the, with the employ, employment team, it's very uh, good for them. It shows that they are, they, are, they are learning adaptability skills, but they're also gaining new skills on how to socialize with different aspects of, of communities or disparate aspects of life. But then it also increases someone's job confidence. They are able to, uh, to speak with experience. You're able to speak with expertise. You're able to speak from a background of knowing because you have tried it, you have done it and you've been there. So it's easy for you to uh, be more marketable if I would want, if I'm, if I'm allowed to use the word marketable. And then uh, we look at the issue of showcasing your fit for open positions, especially if there's an open position, for example, in our organization nowadays, we just don't take on anyone, given the fact that we are working with sensitive issues like sexual exploitation and trafficking in persons. We are very, very keen on taking on people who have been with us as volunteers or who have volunteered within our organization before uh, for the new opening opposition. So you stand a higher chance for that. And of course it prepares you for career and, and or role change. If you want to get into another um, specification or department, it's easier for you to use volunteership to do that. And then the third question was about what ways can volunteering, uh, volunteering continue to be seen as a means of employment or as an employment in itself. Uh, of course, um, when you talk about volunteering, it's connecting you with others, it's helping you create social networks, it's helping you connect with communities, it's helping you create new and stronger relationships. So that increases your chances of employability, but also it means that you will have a network to rely on in case you do get into a certain situation where you need certain skills that you may not have but you have a network of people that have those skills, it's easier for you to reach out to that and get that done as well. So it's rewarding in that way in terms of employability, but also ensuring that you're able to rely on a, on a community of practice that you have put together to support you with your work. And then we're saying that volunteership is also good for the mindset and uh, the physical health of of the employees, but also the volunteers. It reduces on, on aspects of mental health and, uh, and, and depression. So it's not just about employment, it's not just about employment in itself, but it's also rewarding to the personality in terms of uh, reducing stress and depression. And where you feel like there's burnout, you, you may want to take a break from your day-to-day -day activities, your daily schedule and volunteer, and that can help you break that. So it's not just for employment, but it's also a means of, of well-being and, and a way to help you deal with uh, mental health. And then, of course, it can help advance your career, uh, teach you valuable skills, gain uh, career experience, which is increasing your employability and your chances of being employed or starting your own business. And then, of course, it, it's, it's fun and, and it, it's fulfilling in, one, in, in, in life, but it's also advancing one's interests, passions, and also hobbies, because you're able now to showcase what you can do uh, as a person besides your normal, your normal job description. You can also do other things and showcase other talents elsewhere. And of course that increases your chances of uh, 
employment, but also employability in itself, but also ensuring that the work environment is healthy. And of course, increases your social and relationship skills and networks, which I already talked about, which are, will, brings for you more opportunities, more relations, and of course, a bigger uh, community of practice that you can use to tap into. I want to stop there and uh, give um, the space back to Matt. Thank you, Anna. It's a fabulous um, presentation. I really, really appreciate it. It was really, really good. Um, I think what we'll do is rather than doing um, questions now, I think what we'll do is move straight on to uh, the second presentation. But if you have questions or a burning question, if you're or if you're like me, you have to write it down quickly or you'll forget, which might just be age. You can always put your question in the chat and then we for Anna and we'll come come back and pick that up afterwards. But I think we'll, we'll go straight on to the other presentation and then kind of bring it all together for a kind of more thematic conversation and, and discussion. So. Uh, Moses, I think it's over to you. Great, thank you. So as preempted by Anna, I'll also just show my video a little bit so that you know the voice behind the pictures. Um, I'm Moses Okech. I work on Refugee Youth Volunteering Uganda Project, and I'm going to give you the other side of today's presentation. Okay, so... <clears throat> Refugee Youth Volunteering Uganda, um, it's a very, how would I call it, it's a very participatory study uh, that involves four academic institutions. So we have two institutions in the United Kingdom, we have Northumbria University in Newcastle, and we have Loughborough University, and in Uganda we have Uganda Matters University, where I'm based, and Barra University of Science and Technology. Uh, this study was greatly driven by questions around, you know, youth employability with a special focus on refugee youth. Um, so we are trying to understand whether volunteering is indeed um, a pathway through which young people can acquire skills and therefore drive them into employability. So behind this study um, is a big team, um, as you can see there. I'm simply representing them here, but there are lots of great personalities and very eminent scholars out there. Um, we had a number of questions to start with. So basically we wanted to know where the young refugees uh, are based uh, and how they engage with volunteering. The other bit was basically to understand some of the background factors that shape their participation. And we also wanted to know how different forms and types of volunteering actually shape skills development. Um, it was imagined that probably not all types of volunteering would build skills uh, in the same way. And then the impact that this participation in voluntary work would then have in terms of access to future employability. Our approach, um, we had a very qualitative uh, aspect of it, whereby we did a number of um, personal interviews, we did a number of focus group interviews. Um, we are also doing life histories and photographic um, uh, interviews, what we call photo voice. On the quantitative aspect, um, we, are, we have conducted a very large survey, uh, basically to complement some of the findings that are emerging from our qualitative work. I just want uh, to position again uh, this discussion around the areas where this study uh, is taking place. So in Uganda, we have four study sites, and these are basically uh, refugee settlements or where refugees are found. So the well-known one in West Nile, Bidibidi. Then we have two in Southwestern Uganda, Romwanja and Akivale. But we are also looking at urban refugees in Kampala because this is often a very special group that uh, is not so well understood by nature of you know, the, their settlement patterns. Uh, it's not easy to find uh, these refugees in the urban centers because they tend to blend with the community, the host community. 
our study, again, is not looking at all the refugees per se, but we are trying, um, we're looking at some of the most dominant uh, nationalities uh, that comprise refugees in Uganda. So we're looking at nationals from DRC Congo, Somalia, South Sudan, and Burundi. So in terms of the rationale or the why, why we're looking at these three groups, I think that is the reason. Um, these are the most represented groups. Um, we have also uh, tried to stay true the participatory um, calling of this study uh, in that we work with young people. So we've had young refugees form what we refer to as youth advisory boards. And they're not just advisory board uh, for its sake, they actually advise. They advise and guide us on how to young this, work with the young people as we go about our study. And we work with a number of um, community focused organizations that interact a lot with refugees, like AFAD in West Nile, we have the Red Cross uh, and, and Yarid uh, in Kampala and so many others. So basically those are the locations where the study is taking place. Just to bring us, uh, up to speed, you do realize that issues of youth employment or youth transiting into work has been a major global concern. The ILO declaration uh, of 2019 uh, called for an emphasis for integration of young people into what they refer to as the world of work. The following year in 2020, uh, in the next edition, of what they call the global employment trends for youth. Now they seek to see um, this actually entering into the policy arena. So they would like to see uptake, you know, of youth employment, youth employability into national policies. Coming home to Uganda, the ILO at the study uh, together with the uh, Uganda, uh, one of the Ugandan government institutions, Uganda Bureau of Statistics, and a publication came out in 2019. And the study was looking on labor market transition of young people. Now, um, in their survey, they realized that a very large number of the youth uh, that participate in the study, up to 93% and over, had actually attended some form of training or school. Now, their study finds that there's a strong correlation between a young person's education and labor market transition. By labor market transition, they were looking more um, into formal, you know, formal access to employment. But then the same study finds that a vast majority of these uh, youth were uneducated for the jobs that they were doing. So on the one hand, we are talking about educated youth gaining more access to labor and employability, but then a large number were not actually employed in sectors for which they were, they were, they were trained. Up to 56% um, of these students, I mean, of the youth who were surveyed uh, had shown preference for professional jobs. Yet you find that only 3.3% were actually doing professional jobs. So there's that, the question of mismatch then, where do we find real opportunity for the youth? Again, focusing on the issues of volunteering skills and employability in Uganda, um, the ADB, ADB finding of 2014 shows that up to 83% of the youth in Uganda are unemployed. And this unemployment um, is largely attributed you know, to lack of relevant skills. Again, this relates to the UBOS uh, ILO study that we saw in the previous slide. So it should give us some point of reflection. Is it really an issue of uh, lack of skills? Is it an issue of lack of training? Where is the problem? But it's also important for us to try to distinguish between formal and informal work because Many discussions tend to focus so much on formal work, and then the informal work remains kind of in the background. But when we talk about 
uh, volunteering skills and employability. I think it all makes, uh, becomes really important as you'll see later on uh, shown by our study and findings. When you come to the issue of refugee youth, um, this group actually face even more constraints to accessing the labor market or accessing jobs. Why? Because they lack you know, the necessary networks, uh, social connections in a new environment that could help them access um, meaningful work. There's the other debate of volunteering skills and employability. On the one hand, volunteering is actually seen as something that heals you know, positive benefits. You know, it's a smooth pathway to employability. Uh, just like in the previous presentation, you've heard from UYDEL uh, that volunteering is a precursor you know, to accessing jobs. But there's also the other debate that volunteering helps to undercut the cost of labor. So in an institution that is struggling with um, uh, paying or the labor bill, wage bill, sometimes getting young people to volunteer, uh, probably uh, with very minimal allowances uh, or stipends, or sometimes even for no pay, is seen as a very uh, efficient way of doing things. And this also came out from our interviews um, in the refugee settlements with the NGOs that at times employing refugee, refugee volunteers helps them to reduce the cost of labor. There's also the question of self-reliance that through volunteering, um, of course, young people, you know, they gain new skills and with these skills, they can become dependable. But there's also a policy debate and evidence in literature which shows that um, most of what we refer today as volunteering or volunteer labor is, is, is a reflection of you know, what you see in the global north. The debates are looking more at uh, formal volunteering or, in, or, or volunteering in formal sectors. And the informal is kind of being ignored. So we need to reflect more whether um, there's room for more discussion, there's room for more engagement, there's room for more interpretation uh, into what volunteering is and what it can actually do for young people. So there's been that increased focus you know, on programmed or um, program volunteering or planned volunteering over what you might refer to as everyday volunteering, the spontaneous bit of it. Thus, literature brings us to some critical reflection um, there are those who look at volunteering as a neoliberal kind of approach in terms of smoothing you know, pathways to young people being engaged into the labor market. But there's also uh, a group of people who look at volunteering labor uh, as a way of building livelihoods and what is sometimes referred to as responsible citizenship. You know, young people who are actually contributing to the livelihoods uh, of their communities. So therefore, investing in volunteering, if we might put it, is being seen as a good thing, you know? Um, and let's, let's come back again, probably to the global South. If you look at the African Union, African Union has got uh, uh, a policy on volunteering, the African Union Youth Volunteer Course, uh, where they said volunteering helped to build the skills of the youth and thus help the youth contribute to African development. In Uganda, we have uh, a budding uh, volunteering policy. If you look at the national youth policy that looks at things like internships, skills acquisition as being viable pathways for young people to transit into employment. So through the Ministry of Gender, uh, there's a national program on volunteering and the recent discussions in parliament is to scale, scale this up and have compulsory, you know, um, uh, kind of voluntary service in government for young people who are coming out of uh, universities and higher institutions of learning. But some people have looked at this, for instance, if you think in terms of the UN volunteers, 
and the qualifications it takes to join them, uh, some people feel well, the concept of volunteering is now moving away you know, from its basic meaning. Because for you to qualify as a UN volunteer, you must have a lot of experience already. So are they actually volunteers or professionals? That's the question for us to, to reflect on. In one of our interviews around uh, Kampala, uh, one of the respondents had this to say, it can make sense to invest into volunteering, but we cannot invest in volunteering in a way that is disconnected from the market opportunities, but also from skilling and learning opportunities. So there's a whole mix there, you know. Um, so this brings us to the other part of the debate. So do we then see volunteering as a development solution, for instance, that volunteering can lead to employability, it can bring about solidarity, integration, and mutual coexistence. If you look in the case of refugees, you know, we talk about um, the national policy on mutual coexistence with refugees, and volunteering is being seen as one of the ways of bringing communities together. Is it just another way of you know, lowering the cost of service delivery. Um, so what is it? Th these are some of the things that we need to reflect on. But also there's an aspect of whether volunteering or the concept of volunteering as it's practiced today is simply a convenient way of you know, bringing some policy fits. For instance, if the refugees, is more, if more young refugees volunteer, the assumption is that they become self-reliant. So a self-reliant uh, refugee population is then probably less burden to the state. Is that something that we need to reflect on? There's also the whole concept of youth empowerment and participation. Well, um, if youth are participating through labor provision, so they're contributing to building of the economy, but at the same time, we are bringing up the concept of youth empowerment. Does volunteering um, fill gaps in refugee youth employment policy? Why are we saying this? In the case of Uganda, um, where we say we have, of course, one of the more progressive uh, refugee policies, uh, refugees are free to move everywhere, uh, they have land, they settle in and so forth, and they are free to work. But if you read the policy about work into detail, of course, there's still the, the aspect of you don't have um, a work permit for you to do certain kinds of jobs. So are we saying, um, talking ab about volunteering, because then you don't need a permit to volunteer. Is it another way of fitting within the policy without actually addressing the big problem? During the COVID pandemic, of course, we also saw another manifestation uh, in the way in which volunteering is actually working. Um, for instance, in the settlements, uh, so many volunteers lost their jobs because NGOs and other organizations suspended work. So there was reduced opportunities for non-formal learning and heightened job pressures. Now, what does this tell you? Uh, is volunteering uh, a kind of uh, precarious to work? Because if there are no safeguards, uh, for instance, when such problems occur, uh, work is suspended and that's it. You don't have any safety net to fall back on. What does it then tell us about the position of volunteering in as far as uh, youth employability is concerned? Right, so I'll move on now to some of the data that is emerging from our study. Like I said, um, we had a very large uh, survey in the four study sites. And some preliminary findings already show that, um, of course, in terms of participation in volunteering, it's hugely popular. Volunteering is hugely popular among young refugees, up to 70% indicated they have participated in some voluntary work. And some of the reasons they gave for, vol for volunteering are things like helping the community, gaining skills, making friends, getting money, and getting a job. In terms of um, other breakdowns, 37% of the current volunteers um, are securing part of their income through volunteering, 14% securing their income from volunteering, 
And then others are looking at volunteering as work in itself, not just a pathway. So there are some of barriers, of course, uh, that prevent other youth from participating, lack of qualification and lack of skills. Moving forward, I think I want to take us now into what could be part of the reflections of today. How then do we see volunteering? Do we see volunteering as the means to employment or do we see skills acquisition as a precursor to volunteering and therefore employment or do we see volunteering as employment? I'll not go much into that because uh, it's already part of the three questions for discussion. In terms of con my conclusion, I want to say that um, there's a danger of seeing the youth volunteer as an actor with hidden agenda. For those who think, for instance, a poor man cannot volunteer, which is one of the quotations that came out of our study. So that the youth who seek for voluntary uh, um, services are being seen as people with hidden agenda. There's also a risk of others thinking that um, volunteering is a solution to youth unemployment. But amidst all this, there's some tendency to invisibilize or to make invisible non-formal or voluntary work because there's so much focus on formal, uh, formal work or formal volunteering. But amidst all this, of course, are the premises of the debates. Do we see then uh, more debates around volunteering or what's referred to as volunteering uh, premised around you know, the global Northern accounts of things or should we actually bring in some conceptions and understandings of volunteering from the global South? So more debates is needed to debunk the myth around non-formal and formal voluntary work but we should also seek some intellectual space that does not privilege you know, one form of volunteering over the other. I want to stop here and thank you all. Uh, over to you, Matt, thank you. Great, thank you, Moses. You've covered lots and uh, lots and lots of things in there. Um, as I said before, we'll, we'll go on to the kind of two respondents who are going to um, offer their kind of reflections back from their experience. But um, I'd really strong, uh, strongly urge everyone now to start thinking about what are some of the questions that you might have? What are some of the things that the presenters may, may have said that are making you question stuff or think differently about things or things you want clarification on and so on? So if you've got some of those questions, you can post them in the chat on Zoom and then we can pick them up in uh, the discussion once the, uh, the two respondents have given their comments. So I'm gonna hand over now uh, to David um, Andrew Acheng from VSO. So many of you I'm sure know uh, VSO. And David is the program coordinator for livelihoods for VSO Uganda, but obviously VSO is a, a large global actor in this kind of volunteering space and very connected to some of these debates. So, uh, David, I'm going to hand over to you just to give your kind of five minutes of kind of reflections and how this connects to some of your experiences. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Like I said, my name is David Andrew Cheng. I work with uh, VSO in Uganda as a coordinator for livelihoods. I'm happy to identify with this discussion. Of course, I've been building on for uh, some months now, but uh, quick to the point, I just want to uh, reflect on some of the discussions, but also give uh, the VSO lens and uh, perspective when talk about volunteering. First of all, VSO is an international organization we believe we are a leader in, of course, uh, using the volunteering for development approach. And of course, that's what we do best. So in the volunteering for development approach that BSO uses, we uh, always look to uh, place highly committed uh, uh, and, of course, uh, skilled volunteers, of course, uh, to ensure that um, their skills <coughs> generate uh, the greatest value. And of course, uh, in that, we uh, discuss issues around empowerment, both for the volunteer, but also for the community they serve. We respond uh, to many of the crises uh, across uh, development uh, sectors of education, uh, health and livelihoods. VSO uses uh, a blended uh, approach. Of course, uh, it means basically a mix of uh, volunteering uh, approaches, including, of course, uh, the youth uh, network approach formerly ICS, where of course young people are brought on board, mentored to become resourceful, 
but also in the process, they share experiences uh, with the communities. That has now grown into something called, something called the Youth uh, Network or the Youth Champions, where we empower those volunteers to uh, become very strong resources for communities, uh, empower other young people to become advocates of change, but also uh, discuss policy issues around development. We have national volunteers, committee volunteers, international volunteers, and of course, corporate uh, uh, volunteers that uh, come from private sector companies, uh, mostly in Europe. But I want to focus more on, of course, on, uh, on the youth network or the youth volunteers. Initially, it was called ICS because it was actually an international uh, uh, program, attracting young people from UK, of course, mixing them with the uh, local uh, young people uh, in country. Of course, under this, uh, we have now developed something called uh, the Youth Champions Approach. Basically, uh, young people that are empowered to speak about change, to address uh, uh, in, uh, issues of inclusion, but also tackle poverty as young people. Here, of course, we aim at uh, making them be able to co-create solutions for development. And of course, uh, in this, uh, we ensure that uh, the young voices are captured across the program cycle, right from, of course, uh, advocating young people to uh, participate in decision organizations, implement programs, do research, but also to support other peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning opportunities. Of course, uh, we do this through uh, dialogue. We, we, we build a dialogue through digital uh, engagements. We create access to decision makers and also send and also advocate for funding, of course, in terms of uh, building the volunteer resources, but also building community resources. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, enabling confidence of the young people to present, but also to articulate development issues at national global platforms, and of course, and events, where of course, we aim at uh, holding duty bearers accountable, uh, ensuring that we speak about policy issues around development, employment issues, refugee crisis, and then, of course, finally, uh, we ensure that uh, there's a lot of empowerment and, of course, engagement to ensure that uh, these young people can actually become resources in future. I've actually been very brief, but of course, there's a lot uh, we do a lot of volunteering. And uh, back to the questions uh, raised by the previous uh, 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 presenter, that's uh, Mr. Cage. Yes, we believe uh, volunteering is uh, a good thing because it gives uh, space to uh, young people to become empowered. It allows a collaboration between young people and communities. And of course, in that way, young people become resources for communities uh, where, be, where they belong. We have got uh, a lot of uh, stories about impact, about reach, using the volunteering approaches. But also, we have seen that uh, volunteering has empowered young people to become bigger resources to communities and course to this country. So in brief, those are my reflections, uh, moderator, and back to you. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Brilliant, David. Thank you so much. Thanks for um, such kind of uh, a concise, but really, really helpful summary of, of kind of VSO's work, but also a response to, to Moses. That's really, really brilliant. I'm going to hand uh, straight over to Scovia, who's going to give a, an additional response. And I should say, you know, it's really, I'm really delighted Scovia is here. Scovia was, um, is the coordinator for the UNESCO chair on lifelong learning youth and work at Gulu University. And really has, when we were starting to engage with this, really got us thinking very hard about kind of different youth experiences and voices, both, you know, speaking in her identity, both as a volunteer, but also someone who's working in a space around, around learning and skills and, and so on. So uh, Scovia, uh, over to you. It's great to have you here. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, sadly, I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll try at the end to turn on my camera, but the weather is not good, so I'll first keep it off. Uh, so a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Kovia Adrupio. I work with Gulu University in Northern Uganda, and uh, I'm a very dedicated volunteer, but in, uh, can I say, various platforms. So my longest uh, experience in volunteering has been with uh, Rotary, 
I hope some of you have heard of it, uh, Rotary International. And uh, I've been part of Rotary since 2014. And I've never left. So after school, uh, I'm currently part of UNESCO Chair on Lifelong Learning Youth and Work. So the chair sits at Gulu University, but under the chair, we have a team of youth. And these are youth such as myself who just decided to come together to first of all, uh, have that safe space of youths to dialogue. Can I say dialogue? but then go the extra mile to try and help each other with challenges and opportunities to learn, but also like create a, a platform to bring in together the, the, the employment community, let me say, your future employer, the employment community together with us to just sit together and find out uh, which side requires what. So I'm going to be speaking based on that experience. And personally, I can say with the volunteers in Gulu of UNESCO chair, a lot of positivity has come out of this. First of all, the diversity. You're going to have uh, students, you're having young youth who own businesses, you are having uh, prospective uh, youth who want to venture into an, into an enterprise similar or even diverse from, from their fellow youths. So there's this rich community of, 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 of learning that is available. And the stronger bit is the university is part of that. So we have lecturers being part of this and, and together we actually jointly bring the best out of people. So if someone failed, so let me say in mushroom fail in mushroom, then another person who succeeded will probably be able to come in and say, oh, based on what I've done, this is how I've actually managed to succeed. Mm. <clears throat> Moving on to, I think, Rotary, which has been a bigger part of it. I would say for me, it's, it's not just about volunteers. You, you can't just end up being called a volunteer. The organization or the company or whatever, the platform you are volunteering under has to have you at the center, you know? So in Rotary, we always have these opportunities for skills development. And you find that you are trained on practical uh, ventures, or you have, uh, you're connected to, 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 to the business people, to institutions, and you really come down and, and, and build yourselves. Because our first goal of Rotaract is to develop professional and leadership skills in ourselves. So we are not just there to say, okay, we are serving the community, but then what are we getting back from being volunteers? So it's very critical that the volunteers have to be at the center of skill development. Now, going back to the questions of what are the relationships and some of these, these, these connections to employment and, and skills development and volunteering. On a personal note, I can say I got my very first job because I was a volunteer. When I joined in 2014, I had no idea of the benefits that came along. But then this job opening comes and I go on. It needed someone who had done a ton of community projects and really was integrated into the community and had a deep knowledge of the people, their needs, who does what, which services are over ordered by who. So when I came for the interview and they asked me, what experience you have. I just said I had four years of experience because I'd been at the university for four years and this is what I did. I gave practical examples and based on that, I was given the job, but it was not just because I was there and, and uh, you know, there was a whole support system for me as a volunteer to be fine tuned to the person I am today by the organization. 
So volunteering is, yes, a huge opportunity for employment, for skills development. We have volunteers who we support, you know? You, you're going to support someone who has an enterprise. You're having, uh, let's say, practical things. You're having, uh, you're throwing together something. You need a service provider. You know this youth who creates wonderful arts, drawings, or whatever, and you need that service. Then why not reach out to that person? So you, we, we are usually so practical in that if we need a drink and there's this person, then we start with our very own. We have a mushroom farmer and trust me, every other week I'm connecting a person to that youth under UNESCO chair who is growing mushrooms in order to empower that person. So to me, volunteering is so critical, but policy has to come in and support. And one of the, 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 the things I find unjust is especially in, 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 in the employment world, Youths are used as cheap labor because I have a friend who volunteered for six years because they promised him, the, the organization promised, it's an entry thing. You start with volunteering, then we shall offer you six years. Imagine the opportunities, the benefits from employment that he missed because he was clinging on hope of becoming an employer, um, an employee of this company. So to the policy people, to Matt and the team who are finally giving volunteering the attention it deserves. I really hope some of these issues can be streamlined and our youth are supported in better ways. I hope I've not taken so much time, but I thank you so much, everyone. Matt, back to you. Fabulous. Uh, thank you, Scovia, David. Thank you for the two uh, presenters. Amazing set of presentations, um, really, really rich insight, really, really thoughtful. As I said before, please do post questions or comments in the chat, and in a minute we'll go on to just opening up the conversation. But I thought it might be interesting, I, I, as, as the speakers have been talking, I've been writing down some words that, that have come up. And I suppose if you go back to what we said right at the start about, you know, volunteering has become a very powerful thing in the kind of humanitarian development, youth employability space. And I wrote down inclusion, skills, livelihoods, work, learning, empowerment, displacement. And I thought this last point um, that Scovia made to add on that is the kind of cherry on the cake to this is a promise. Volunteering is often caught up in these promises to, to people. It makes a promise that it will do something for certain stakeholders or certain people. So if you think of all those kind of that language and all those words, there's an awful lot hanging on the relationship between volunteering and youth and skills and employability. So we're going to...